All right. I mean, the the T-shirt's appropriate for the class, I thought. So, so I want to start off this lecture with a question. So, the last lecture I uh, used a lot of uh, you know PowerPoint or Keynote um, instead of the usual chalkboard. How many people prefer that versus the chalkboard? So, if you prefer the Keynote, chalkboard. Oh, yikes. Okay. Just, kind of ironic that it takes a lot more time to, to prepare the keynote presentation than to just do something from the chalkboard. So I think in the future I'll, um, I think it probably slows me down a bit, so I give you a lot more information more quickly if I do things in the PowerPoint. So I think I'll try to cool it for the rest of the uh, semester on that. And in the future I probably won't do it. Okay. But you're going to have to live with it just a little bit longer. <laughs> And what I want to do is finish up the lecture I, I started uh, last time, which was um, how the evolution of helpful behaviors occurs. And just to remind you, we talked about, we, dis we discussed the number of different types of interactions between organisms where both interactors, the donor and the recipient, benefit. That's called mutualism. That's easy to explain. Predation, or where one, of, one benefits and the other doesn't, that's easy to explain. But th these cases where the, the donor doesn't have doesn't appear to have any advantage in the interaction, that is that they, they suffer a cost, those were difficult to explain. That is to say, how do we explain altruistic or helpful behavior? And there are two explanations, just to remind you. The first explanation is that it's not really that helpful because ultimately the donor will benefit. That's called reciprocal altruism. It just, you don't get a benefit immediately, you, you get one down the road. Uh, the other uh, explanation I wanted to give or I did give, is called kin selection. This is Bill Hamilton's idea. And the basic idea is that you're helping close relatives. Okay? And in that case, you're helping, oh, I don't like that at all. Let's try this one. There's some benefit that the, that the uh, recipient gets called B. And there's some cost to you, which we call C. But the point here is that the, the individuals you're helping, the individuals who get the benefit, are related to you by some factor R. Okay? And Bill Hamilton said that if the relatedness times the benefit minus the cost to you is greater than zero, then an imaginary gene that causes you to act you know, in an altruistic way towards close relatives could spread through a population. Okay? So the population, the math works, is what I'm saying. And it's easy to see, but basically, there, he introduced this idea of what we call inclusive fitness. This is the idea that your fitness can be calculated as, as adding two parts together. The first part is the usual fitness, that is, the number of kids you have, the number of offspring you have. But it also can be uh, calculated by including the offspring of your close relatives. Okay, so the, the offspring of your close relatives don't count for as much as a, uh, one of your offspring do, but they do count as sort of a devalued child, as far as you're concerned. So um, you, can, you can increase your fitness in two ways. That is by having more kids or by having your close relatives have more kids. That's the point. So that is what this statement says right here. So this is sort of in words. Yikes, this isn't working, by the way. The pointer isn't working. Um, so that's what this statement is saying. So I just said that. So a little bit about relatedness this is something I covered last time, but um, we can calculate our relatedness uh, is the probability that two alleles sampled at the same gene are identical by descent. That is, they can trace themselves to the same copy in the in the parents or somewhere down the line in your grandparents or great grandparents. And so for full sibs, there's two ways that uh, a brother and a sister, for instance, can, be uh, can share a gene. That is, they can share the gene through the mother or through the father. And so there's two separate paths that you need to consider when you calculate the relatedness. For a, full, for a half sib, on the other hand, you're only, you're only related through the shared parent, the mother or the father. So there's only one path to consider. And uh, half sibs are half, you know, related to one another by half as much as full sibs are. Now, you're not going to be responsible for how to calculate relatedness. I'm hoping this is an intuitive um, uh, idea to you, though. So, eusociality um, is a form of altruism. Uh, 
which has these following uh, broad characteristics. So first of all, uh, you, have a, you typically have this overlap in generations between the parents and the offspring. That is to say, you don't have um, all, the, all of the individuals of some cohort dying off at the same, at the same time and then having a new uh, generation being formed. You have overlap in the parents and the, and the offspring, kind of like we do, right? Uh, you have cooperative brood care, and it's often, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you have these specialized casts of non-reproductive individuals. So think of worker bees, for instance, or, or casts of ants which forego reproduction to help uh, maintain or grow the hive or the nest. Why, you know, how can, why do these individuals forego reproduction? That seems like the ultimate, that is the ultimate form of altruism, right? Where you completely forego your own reproduction to help out others. How can that, that, that form of um, altruism uh, uh, arise? Here's an example of an altruistic or a, of a youth social insect. These are leaf cutting ants, where you have these little ants go out into the forest, and they, they uh, forage for leaves, and they bring back these leaves to the nest, and then they have other workers in the nest that uh, chew up the leaves, and they cultivate a fungus. And ultimately what they do is they eat the, the fungus. So these, these are... Um, really cool insects they are kind of like little, little farmers, if you will. Now, the interesting thing about a lot of the youth social insects, like the uh, bees and the, and the um, bees and the wasps, or, or, or uh, bees and insects, or bees and ants, I'm sorry, uh, is that they have a special form of uh, sex determination called haplodiploidy. Now, in this, in this form of um, sex determination, Females form from uh, fertilized eggs, so they're diploid. And so, of course, if you're forming from a fertilized egg, you have a mom and a dad. On the other hand, the brothers, the males, are uh, formed by uh, un formed from unfertilized eggs. They're haploid. They have one copy of each chromosome. Were you able to get me a pointer by any chance at work? Oh, okay. Well, I guess I wasn't pushing the button correctly. I thought I knew that. So, in, so let's look at how these, these uh, sisters are related to one another. Now, normally, of course, uh, full sibs would be related to one another by a factor of one half. But the point here is that the chromosome that they might share from their father has to be the same chromosome because dad only has one chromosome to give. So when you, when you trace the path through the mom, it's the usual one where you go one half of a factor up times one half of a factor down. So that's one quarter. Plus, going to the father, it's a one half times a one. They have to share that chromosome because dad only has one chromosome to give. So in the end, sisters are related to one another by kind of this elevated fraction three quarters. So they're much more closely related to each other than normally full sibs would be related to one another. Now I'm not gonna go through the other calculations, but sisters and brothers uh, are related to one another by a factor of one quarter, a relatedness of one quarter. And mothers are related to their sons and daughters in the usual way. So parents, like for instance, I'm, I'm related to both my children, my son and my daughter, by a factor of one half. Okay, there, I'm equally related to both my children. And that's the case for these, um, for, uh, for these eusocial insects as well, the haplodiploid insects as well, where the mother-daughter relationship and the mother-son relationship is the usual one, one half to one half. So just, just realize, in terms of what I want you to take away from this, this figure, Realize that mothers are related to the children in the usual way, equally, equally related to sons and daughters, but the offspring have this asymmetry in their relatedness. Uh, the, the sisters are related to one another by a factor of three quarters. They're very highly related to one another, whereas they're much less related to their brothers, and that's unusual. Um, and I should also say to you that it's the sisters that are uh, the, uh, form the cast, the workers in, in these, in these uh, eusocial insects. So there's a couple of interesting things that come out of here. So first of all, first of all, I want to mention that people believe that a large, a large reason why you can have eusociality evolve in these insects is because of this unusually high R among the, the, the females. That is to say that when R is, is, is bigger, that it's easier to satisfy this inequality. True? It may not be the only reason, but they, they think it's a very important contributing factor. And you'll see that in eusocial mammals, which don't have this haplodiploidy sex determining mechanism, it's also the case that the uh, workers are very highly related to one another. I'll get to that in a bit. 
So that's the first thing I want to mention. High R means that this inequality is easier to satisfy, and that's probably contributed to the, the evolution of eusociality. But there's also some interesting uh, predictions that the unequal relationship between um, uh, work uh, between brothers and sisters in uh, has, and what the what the queen, which is the reproductive individual in one of these nests, has. So remember the queen, the one that's the reproductive individual, the mother of all the, the insects and in the of all the offspring in the in the hive. Uh, has an equal re relationship to sons and daughters. So she should favor, based on this equal relationship between sons and daughters, an equal investment in sons and daughters as well. That is to say, she should favor the same number of, of males and females to be repro reproduced in the, uh, in, the, in the hive. The workers, however, which are all females, should favor an unequal sex ratio. They should favor, to ha they should favor a ratio of three females to every one male because they're three times more related to their sisters than they are to their brothers. So that you get this sort of parent-offspring conflict, not the type of parent-offspring conflict you may have undergone with your parents as teenagers, but one where you really are investing different amounts, really do favor investing different amounts in brothers and sisters, males and females in the hive. Once again, the queen, an equal investment in males and females because she's equally related to both, and the workers, which are all females, preferring an unequal investment in, in females and males. In fact, they, they should favor a three to one investment ratio because they're three times more related to their sisters than they are to their brothers. And the question is, what do you actually see in, in, these, in these hives, in these eusocial groups? Do you see an unequal investment or do you see an equal investment? And that's been examined a couple of different times. Oh, so this is just restating what I said, that the queen favors a one to one investment and the uh, females, the, the workers in the, in the hive, uh, favor a three to one investment. So this has been investigated a number of times. Um, Trivers, like, oh gosh, 35 years ago almost, uh, Trivers and Hare actually found uh, this expected three to one investment ratio, meaning the, the workers are actually controlling the investment in males and females in, in these nests. And Mueller, who's at University of Texas now, also showed that the worker hymenopterans can alter their investment colony uh, their investment in their colony mates depending on the relatedness. That is to say, what happens when, so, so let's say you have a queen and then she founds the nest and all the workers, all the offspring are, are founded from that one queen. They're all, they're all uh, sons and daughters of that one queen. What happens when that queen dies? Well, what happens is one of the female workers, they're all sexually competent. They can, in principle, become sexually reproductive. One of them becomes sexually reproductive. Okay, so now she's the queen. What this means is that all the workers around now aren't helping out their sisters and brothers, they're helping, helping out their niece and nieces and nephews, right, which have a much different relatedness, much lower relatedness. So they should now start to favor a more equal investment in males and females. Once, once you have a new queen, the relatedness between males and females, brothers and sisters, becomes more equal. You're helping ra raise nieces and nephews which are related to you by, in these cases, a factor of about 0.37, okay? And so they, you should see a, a change in the investment strategy in these nests where the queen is actually one of the sisters. And they find, that's what Mueller found. They found that you can actually, um, that, the, that the workers actually can, can control their uh, investment and change the ratio of males and females in these, in these colonies. So, the point here is that relatedness can explain a lot in terms of the investment strategies that you see in these nests. Okay? And that's the only point I really want you to, to remember. That when, you have, when you're equally related to some other individual, you should favor an equal investment. Evolution predicts that you should favor an equal investment in males and females. And um, when it's not equal, then you should have an unequal investment. And that's exactly what you can see in these, in these uh, eusocial uh, groups of insects. Now, before I go on to the topic for today, I want to give one more example of eusociality, and that's in these naked mole rats. These are mammals, believe it or not. Um, they're moles, so they burrow underground. Here's, a <coughs> here's the version of the naked mole, mat, uh, mole rat that my daughter has, a little stuffed animal. Um, but the, they, they basically, these are mammals that live underground in groups of about 200 individuals. And just like in these youth social insects where you have sort of a queen bee that does all the reproduction, you have uh, breeding restricted to just a single queen and to, a, and to just a couple kings, okay? That's to say males that, that mate with the female and are the fathers of all the offspring in, the, um, in this group. And these other individuals in this group of 200 uh, are non-reproductive. They act kind of like worker bees, okay? They, they go gather food, they 
they defend the, the nest, they, they you know, extend the nest to be burrowing and so forth. They're diploid like all mammals. They have the same sort of, they have the same sex determining mechanism that we have. Um, but it turns out that these individuals are highly inbred. And so the relatedness among very highly inbred organisms is, is unusually high. And in this case, the, the relatedness is 0.81, which is even higher than you have between uh, females, you know, sisters in a, in a eusocial haplodiploid uh, group. Um, and this basically is another, this is one of the explanations for why you have this high relatedness. 85% of all the matings are between parents and their offspring, or, or between full sibs. So when you have that type of reproduction, you get you know, very high relatedness values. But the main point here, again, is that in these groups where you see altruistic behavior evolving, it's, it appears to be associated with a very high R relatedness, meaning that, once again, this inequality is easier to satisfy. Now, that is all I wanted to say um, for the first lecture. Let's go ahead. That's kind of gross. So I'll blank it since it's so gross. Um, so that was a lot of material to get in a lecture and a half. So remember, we talked about um, sexual selection, and we talked about the evolution of altruistic <coughs> behavior Okay, in a lecture and a half. Um, that was, like I said, a lot of material. The main points I want you to remember from sexual selection is um, the ex explanation for that, that you either have the, the, the dimorphism in males and females is caused by either competition among males for access to females or the females choose. You should understand why females might be the choosy sex, that is to say there is this anisogamy uh, rearing its head. And um, you might uh, think about some of the reasons or understand some of the reasons why the females may on what basis females might choose a mate. So for instance, one explanation I gave is that some direct benefit the males bring, such as food or a good nesting uh, site, or um, the good genes hypothesis. That is to say, the males uh, have some uh, genetic quality that the females are looking for. Those are the explanations I gave there. And then in terms of the um, uh, evolution of helpful behaviors, we talked about reciprocal altruism, and we talked about kin selection. And so you should, you should understand what those are and be able to give an example of each. And if you can do that, I would be a very happy person. And you would be too, because you will have done well on the exam. So the next half lecture and lecture are going to be uh, covering um, what I think is a quite interesting area of, of evolutionary biology. And that is how species form. So if you look at the diversity of life today, we have millions and millions of species. And yet all organisms on Earth are related to one another through some common ancestor, mean, which means that if you go back in time further and further, there must have been one species billions of years ago that gave rise to all of, all of organisms on, on Earth today. The process, this branching process by which we increase diversity, this branching process, the branches, the splitting events are caused by what we call speciation. And of course, the thing that, that, that prunes away diversity is when species go extinct, right? And we have lots of examples of extinction as well. But over time, the rate at which species form has been greater than the rate at which species die out, so that's why we have so much diversity on Earth today. That's why we have so many different kinds of species around. So the second lecture, I want to talk about the process of speciation. And as I'll discuss in that lecture, it's all about turning off gene flow between populations. And once you turn off gene flow between populations, then the species can, ev the, the populations can evolve independently. And we'll talk about genetic mechanisms, for example, that cause, or that prevent species from coming back together and, and forming one species again later in time. But today what I want to do is I want to sp spend most of my time discussing what is a species in the first place. So two questions. What is a species? And secondly, how do species form? And let me see if I can find some better chalk. Yes, good. Once again, this is the lect this is today's lecture, and we'll we'll postpone discussing this until the till um, Wednesday. <coughs> 
So what is a species? So there's a number of definitions that we can use. Sometimes they're called species concepts or definitions. But we're only going to discuss two. There's quite a few, and, and remarkably, there's more debate about what a species is among evolutionary biologists than you'd expect. Okay? Now, it turns out, even though there's a large number of species concepts or definitions, usually it doesn't matter. Usually all of these different methods or concepts agree on, on uh, saying, for instance, that humans or chimps are two different species. There's no debate among any, any, anybody about, uh, in, in some cases. But it's the cases where species are recently formed. That is to say, the speciation event that led to the two different species we see today occurred recently in time, say maybe a couple hundred thousand years ago, where it's more difficult to distinguish the species and these different species concepts often disagree, which is what you'd expect, right? When, when things are very closely related to one another, when the speciation, speciation event that led to the two species occurred very recently, the species are very similar to one another and it becomes difficult to distinguish them. Okay, now, given enough time, of course, they'll differentiate more and it would become easier for future biologists to distinguish the two species. But you know, there's lots of species today alive that, that it's difficult to distinguish them and it becomes a, a problem of expertise. But I'm gonna discuss two um, species concepts. The first species concept is the one you probably think of. And what I'm gonna do to describe the species concept is imagine the following scenario, where you go out to nature and you grab individuals and you measure the individuals for some number of traits. That is to say, things you can see on the organism. Maybe you go to gophers and you measure their, their weight and their length, for instance. Or maybe you go to gophers and you measure some, uh, some uh, you know, features of their bones, their, the length of the, the femur or whatever. So what we have is we're going to, just to simplify this, we're only going to imagine two traits. You have trait one and you have trait two. And when you measure one individual, it's going to fall somewhere on this xy plot. And then you go and you measure another individual, another individual. What you would find is clusters of of individuals. Some, some individuals have similar values for the two traits and others have different but similar values for, for these traits. Many people would, would, if, would go out into nature and say, well, all the individuals that cluster here, they're going to be called species one, and the individuals over here we're going to call species two. Okay, so this is the morphological species concept. And it's often abbreviated the MSC, the Morphological Species Concept. That is to say, just to repeat, you distinguish different species based on the morphology. And specifically, you look for gaps like this in the morphology between different groups of organisms. Now, when you, when you identify species, of course, you need to give them a name. And in principle, it shouldn't matter what we name the species. But um, among scientists, there is a convention we follow, and that is to use uh, this uh, Latin binomial system for naming species. That is to say, every species gets two names, a genus name and a species name. And um, when you write these things, that when you write a genus and species name down uh, in a newspaper article or in a scientific paper, the genus name should always be uh, capitalized and the species name should always be lowercase. It should, uh, and uh, in principle, you should also italicize the species, which in the olden days, since I can't actually write italics uh, printing, you would underline it if you were doing it on a typewriter, say. Okay. But if you ever see a newspaper article where the species name is capitalized, you'll know that they actually, uh, it's not a biologist because they inappropriately capitalize the species name. Anyways, every species gets a genus and species name. And uh, in our case, for instance, this would be Homo sapiens, would be the genus and species for humans. Now, what are some of the problems with the um, morphological species concept? One of the one problem is what traits are important. 
So a lot of species that where there's variation within, among individuals within the species for different traits. And for instance, if you were to look at those traits, you might actually um, call things different species that really aren't. So for instance, in humans, I can look out in the audience, I see a lot of people with dark hair, and I see some people with blonde hair. And we can say, well, there's the difference. You know, I can actually make a plot, uh, make one, since we're only looking at one axis, we'll say, here's a hair color, and the frequency, and I would say, well, there's a lot of people with blonde hair, and there's some people with dark hair, why don't I call those two different species? We all know, of course, that would be a silly thing to do, that, that there's other, you know, other distinguishing features that might be more important to look at among individuals, and that we would classify all the individuals in this room as members of a single species. But the point here is that you need to, you know, it's a, it's a judgment call about which traits are important and which aren't. And it's often a matter of expertise on the part of the biologist. That's one thing I want to point out. Sexual dimorphism can also be problematic in some cases. And here I want to give you this example, which I think is really neat. So here's an example of a highly sexually dimorphic species. Um, these are insects of the order Strepsiptera. I'll just give you, let's say, e.g. Strepsiptera. Remember that um, I just said that they're an order to themselves. So these are of the same classification level as beetles and, and bees and wasps and, you know, and true bugs and so forth. Uh, but they're very little, not much is known about their biology. There's only a couple hundred species of these, of these critters known. And what you see up here on the top left is a wasp that has been what they call stylopized. It's, it's been parasitized by a female of the species. And what happens is the female, uh, as a larvae, sort of gloms onto the side and they burrow into this poor wasp. And then the female strepsipteran takes over the entire abdominal cavity of the wasp. And basically the female gets all her nutrients from her host. So if you look at these things, at the females at least, the females, if we were to dissect the female out of this wasp, they look like an undifferentiated bag. Okay, that's all they really look like. And you can see that these little extrusions uh, in the abdominal cavity of the, from the abdominum of the, of the wasp, this is just one part of the strepsipteran female that's emerging outside. And what happens is that occasionally she, young emerge from openings here, uh, and basically the, the young are either gonna be males or females. If it's a female, uh, basically they hang around looking for another wasp or insect to glom onto and parasitize. And if it's a male, the male emerges, there's a male, and the male remarkably lives only for a few hours. They um, have non-functioning mouth parts. They don't have a digestive system, believe it or not. Can you imagine that being an organism without functioning mouth parts? So they don't feed, obviously. They live only for a few hours, and, and their mission in those two hours is to find a female and mate before, it, before he dies. That's all they do, right? And you know, I know a little bit about the biology of these guys, because I, I really think they're cool, but if you look here, they have these, the males have these really big antenna. And if you look at them under like very high magnification, you can see these antenna have what look like lots of receptors, which are probably for pheromones. People don't know for sure, but they think that the females uh, release pheromones and the males are attracted to them. Anyway, so these are really cool organisms. Now, there's the male, I said, it looks kind of fly-like. They're called twisted wing flies, by the way, if that's a common name. There's the male. The female, like I said, looks like an undifferentiated bag. Remarkably, remarkably, Trained biologists, people that are experts in this group, cannot match the males of the sp and the females of the sp same species together. The, f the males and the females have no characteristics in common. So how can you actually match them up? Okay, so sexual dimorphism, this is an example of very extreme sexual dimorphism, but this is an example where even identifying males and females and placing them in the same species can be problematic. In this particular case, what do people do? Well, they're starting to resort to genetics. So they're starting to sequence DNA and look for um, you would match up males and females based on how similar their DNA is, which is remarkable that you'd ever have to even uh, resort to such an extreme measure to match up males and females of the same species. We don't have that problem in our species, even though we're dimorphic, I hope. So that's one example of a problem. Um, another is polymorphism. So polymorphism means many, that's the poly, and morph is form, so many forms. And there are species where, um, like us, that are polymorphic for various traits. 
So here's an interesting example. Here's an example from a butterfly of the, of the genus species Astrapes uh, fulgurator. And all the adults look like this. They're monomorphic. So there's only one form for the adults. A very kind of pretty uh, blue patch here and black wings. The larvae, however, look like this for this species. The larvae are highly polymorphic. So here's 10 different uh, polymorphisms that you can find that are all named in this one species. So the point here is that if you were to base your species names in this, in this particular species, this particular butterfly species, based on the polymorphism you see in the larvae, you would say that you have 10 different species, right? Whereas you only see, oops, you only see one adult form. Now in this particular case, it turns out, biologists think that these different uh, larval forms, the polymorphism you see in the larvae aren't important and that we really only have one species. Um, but but it, it, is, it does point out a, a problem with the, with the morphological species concept is how do you decide that the polymorphisms you see among the larvae aren't important? Okay. And just to contrast that example, here's sparrows. These are adult sparrows of different species and to my eye at least, and, and I'm not a trained ornithologist by any means, but by, to my eye, the, the forms you see here, the variation you see among these different species of sparrow look like smaller differences than you see among the, the differences in the, in the larvae in the butterfly example. But in this case, the differences among the, among the adults are significant, and people do classify these diff as different species. Okay, so I'll blank that. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Now, it's often the case that, um, that the morphological species concept is the only one that can be applied in a case, in, in, in a situation. So for instance, um, paleontologists, people that study fossils, they're forced to use the morphological species concept. But there's one other species concept that I want to discuss. And that is the biological species concept. Or the BSC. In a way, the biological species concept is letting the organisms themselves decide who's, a spe you know, who's in the same species and who isn't. Okay? The biological species concept uh, is the idea that uh, Individuals are the same species if they freely interbreed with one another. Under natural conditions. Now the freely interbreeding part can usually be tested or can often be tested experimentally. That is to say, you take two flies of different sexes and put them in a fruit bottle, in a bottle, and you ask whether or not they, they uh, can mate and the offspring are fertile. Okay. If that's the case, then they, they, then they can clearly interbreed with one another. That's not always the case. Okay. Sometimes organisms can, can uh, mate and form offspring, but those, those offspring might be um, infertile. Or sometimes the, the offspring will, you, know, you might have an egg form, but it won't develop into, a, into an adult. Okay. So that they can't form offspring. But there are often cases where you can take, you know, you can actually test that. You can ask if I put a fly of this, you know, a male of this uh, so-called species with a female of this other potential species, do they, do they breed and, and, and form fertile offspring? Yes or no? The other question, the other part of this definition isn't as easy to, um, to determine. Can they do this under natural conditions? Um, so the, the thought, the, the, this consideration is one where you have to think about the plausibility that these individuals are going to find one another in nature. Now there's some cases where that might not be so problematic. So you can imagine, for instance, uh, say a bird species. Um, here's Asia, and on this side we'll put North America. So you can imagine, let's say, a bird species that lives along the west coast of, of North America and along the coastal region of Asia, say. I mean, <coughs> you might 
even in a laboratory, I mean, you can always take these things and put them in a zoo. You can take males and females from these two species, hypothetical example, put them in a zoo and ask whether they, they produce fertile offspring. The answer may be yes. Okay. But then the question becomes, do they do that under natural conditions? Re realizing that there's a very large ocean that separates North America and, and Asia. So do they do that under natural conditions? The answer may be no. Maybe these guys don't migrate. Okay, maybe they can't fly 5,000 miles. In which case, you might, even though they might form fertile offspring, you might still decide to call them different species because they don't do that under natural conditions. So keep that in mind. So th like I said, there's, um, this is, this, from our perspective, this biological species concept is going to be um, considered the, the correct species concept. Uh, I'm saying this with the realization that lots of my colleagues across the world would probably be shouting at me right now because they might have a biological species or concept for species that's quite different. But we're going to consider it the correct species, and I think it's the most useful for a couple reasons. Um, one, it's, it's one that it's allows, like I said, the organisms themselves to determine what species they're from. But secondly, it's going to be important for our next lecture when we talk about how species form. And remember, I, I said species formation is about cutting off gene flow, migration. So if this, these arrows represent potential migration or gene flow between these populations. The formation of species is all about preventing gene flow or having gene flow being turned off between different populations. In that sense, the biological, you're preventing mating or, or interbreeding between, the, organi between the, the groups, between the populations. And from this perspective, the biological species concept is the most useful, in my opinion, for understanding how species form. Now that said, although it's, we're going to be termed, for the purposes of this class, we're going to be considering the, the correct species concept, it's not always universally applicable. So again, let's imagine this poor paleontologist who uh, sees an, a new form, a new species, potential species in the fossil, re fossil record. They're not in a situation where you can actually um, test the biological species concept. So I'll, I'll tell you um, right now, I haven't actually tried this, but I'm almost certain this would be the case. You take a box, right? There's your box, and you put it, two different fossils into that box, and you wait, and you're not going to get little fossil offspring. Okay, that's a guarantee. I'm almost certain of that. I've never done it myself, but I'm almost certain. You can't do these experiments in things that can't reproduce, obviously. And often it's the case that um, you, you can't, some, some species are very difficult to rear in the lab, for instance, or even keep alive in the lab, so it'll obviously be very difficult to test whether or not they can interbreed with one another in laboratory conditions, at least, in those situations. Uh, if, it, under the biological species concept, um, even if the species to our eye look the same, even if there's no morphological differences that we can distinguish, um, if, they, if, if, if the individuals rep recognize each other as being different species, then we call them different species. So remember, once again, e the biological species concept doesn't mean that you can actually distinguish them morphologically. As long as the organisms can do it, then they're different species, even if we can't distinguish them. And there are some examples, for instance, in Drosophila, flies, where it, it's incredibly difficult to distinguish uh, among different species. It usually, the most of the morphology is identical, and the only way you can really distinguish between the species is if you're an expert on the morphology, and it's usually the penis of the flies that allows you to determine whether or not they're different species or, or not. Okay? The, that's the most rapidly evolving part of the morphology in many flies, it turns out. But for almost anybody else, um, it's very any human that is, it's very difficult to tell the difference. And of course, the flies have no problem de determining whether they're different species or not. Let's go look at some examples here. So here's an example of, um, uh, of a, here's an example where morphologically you have different populations that look as if they're different species, but we have one species. And this is a this is an example of what's called a ring species, um, and it was it, it's a it's a genus of salamander, of uh, uh, Incentina, uh, which was studied for ages by a, a fellow who's still in, in the um, museum here, Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, called David Wakes. He's a very famous herpetologist. He's retired now, but for much of his career, he studied these um, California salamanders. And these salamanders have a range that goes all the way from San Diego along the coastal range and then in, and along the Sierra Nevadas. And the interesting thing about these, these um, salamanders is each population often has a, what looks like a different form. So what, I'm sh what in, this, in this figure here you see, here's the salamander that you find here, here's the salamander you find here along in Monterey, here's one you find up here in the Bay Area, and so forth. You know, to my eye, and to many, historically to many herpetologists' eyes, 
they look like different species, and originally they were classified as such. But it turns out that if you look at and ask the question, well, how about these, the population here, can it interbreed with the population here? And the answer is yes. There's three interbreeding between these populations here. And then you can ask the question, how about the individuals here? Can the population here interbreed with the population here? And the answer is yes. There's three interbreeding here. There's three interbreeding among the populations all along this ring, except when you come to this gap. And it turns out, it, if you take the individuals here and ask, can they interbreed with the population here, it turns out they can't. Okay, so this is a ring species. You have gene flow all along this ring, and, but the gene flow is small enough that by the time you get to the very end of the ring, they're, they're the populations are different enough that they can't, can't interbreed. In this case, they're all, they're all classified as being one species, even though you do have this situation where at the end of the rings, the, the, the individuals, the population can't interbreed. Really cool example. Here's, another, here's an example where um, uh, in baboons, where originally there were five different species of baboons in, in, um, in Africa. And they all have different forms, so you can actually easily distinguish these different forms. And, and like I said, they were originally given different species names. But when people looked at these populations in more detail, they realized that uh, these, the adjacent populations were freely interbreeding with one another. And so they reclassified the, the baboons to be all members of one species. And then they gave, um, sometimes you'll actually see this, you have the genus name, the species name, and sometimes you'll have a subspecies name appended. So what happened here was that what was originally different species, they gave them different subspecies names. and. One question that comes up, which is mostly just a, a note keeping, notebook keeping type of, of problem, which is you had five species before, now we have one name. What name do we use? And one, one, op, one, uh, one possibility is just use a, a brand new name, a name that hasn't been used. But what, they, what the usual solution is, is you use the oldest name, the name that was first applied to, the, uh, to any of the five species, and that's the one that wins. So usually um, that's what they do in these cases, where, where you reclassify the organism. One of the points here is that people can change their mind in, in, the, in this business of naming species. As we get more information, as people realize that these, even though they had different forms, that the species just turned out to be polymorphic. The, poly, the forms weren't important. They weren't important to the baboons, at least, because they didn't care. They would be interbreeding one group to another. So scientists are always willing to change their minds uh, if they get enough evidence. Now. As evolutionary biologist species are interesting for a number of reasons, the main one being that um, we understand how species form, we learn a lot about, about how the diversity on life was created. But there's legal reasons why, um, why species and, and this game of naming species can become quite important. And that has to do with a law that was passed in 1973 called the Endangered Species Act. Okay. And this, this, this law, the, the intent is quite good, I think. So the idea here is that if a species is, is, is in danger of going extinct, that you know, land is set aside or its habitat is protected. You're not allowed to um, um, mess with the population in such a way that you might endanger its, um, its chances of survival. Now, the intent, like I said, is good, but often it's the case that the Endangered Species Act conflicts with um, uh, economic activity. And this is an example of, of just that. This is the, um, a, a larkspur, the Baker's larkspur. It's a, it's a plant that lives up near Point Reyes. So it's a flowering plant that near, lives near Point Reyes. And there's a very, I mean, historically the population was quite big, but even in 1942 when it was first described, um, the, the person who described the species noted that its population was getting smaller and smaller. The number of individuals was getting smaller and smaller, mostly because of farming activity. And so uh, now there's only a couple populations of these things around. Um, in fact, almost all of them were wiped out recently by road crew construction work. They just uh, sort of accidentally, guys with bulldozers who were working on along the road accidentally wiped out almost all the species. Uh, and they didn't do it intentionally, of course. But in this particular case, um, there was a housing development uh, that was was proposed to go into their neighbor, native ha habitat. People filed a lawsuit saying, "No, you can't do that because this is the only habitat for this this larkspur." Okay. The point being here that um, 
there was a conflict between the economic activity that would have brought jobs, construction jobs, for instance, and protecting the, the one the last population of these large scale. So it's often the case that as a society, we have to make a decision about which, which way we go. Do we protect the species or do we uh, allow economic activity to go un unabated? And I'm not going to tell you which way to go on that. Here's an example that I thought was pretty cool. Um, and it's mostly b because I was only very peripherally involved as the office mate of the person who was involved in this. So as a graduate student, my office mate was this fellow, Paul Chippendale. And Paul worked on the species of salamander of the, um, of the genus Eurecia that lives in central Texas. So it lives along st in streams in central Texas and it also lives in caves. So he did a lot of caving, spelunking, looking for these salamanders. It's a neotenic salamander, meaning that it still has gills as an adult. We'll talk, we, uh, we won't be talking about that, but so you can see these gills. And part of his dissertation was doing a population genetic survey of all, the, of all these salamanders in central Texas. And he discovered in the course of doing this that there were some genetically isolated populations, populations that looked like they were different species. And you know, he, in some of these cases, he was able to associate the, these different populations and these different species with morphological differences. But for the most part, these, these Eurecia, even of different species, look very, very similar to one another. So it's very difficult to distinguish among, among the different species, unless you're an expert like Paul. Now, it came up to be quite interesting because um, one of these species that he discovered had one population that happened to live in this pool. Now, how many of you know Austin, Texas, and know what this pool is? Anybody know what this pool is? It's kind of, it's a really neat uh, part of Austin. This is called Barton Springs. It's almost in the downtown area of, of Austin. And a lot of people come here, especially during the hot season, which is, of course, most of the year in Austin, and they, they swim. It's basically a creek that was dammed up, forming this pool, and you can see there's like a diving board, and people often hang out in the grass and they swim. It's a great place. But the, but the um, salamanders lived, I think actually one of the populations was right here underneath the diving board, because I remember helping Paul collect these things, and you could get a lot of them right there. Normally not a problem. It's just a pool, and, and the people swimming around in the pool doesn't, didn't really disrupt the population at all. But the problem was this. Is a lot of people would be swimming laps in this pool, or, or they're, you know, they're swimming in, in this pool, and then they complained to the lifeguard saying, look, you know, I was swimming here, and there was like, you know, a, some grass or whatever in the bottom of the pool. pool. I mean, this is a natural spring, so of course there's plants and stuff growing on the bottom of this. So what they did to, to, to satisfy these complaints is occasionally, maybe once a week, they drain this pool, that is to say, open the dam, let the water flow out, and then they power wash the limestone that, that formed the bait that, you know, that was along the bottom here, getting rid of all the weeds. And of course, that was great because nobody then had you know, the icky weeds along their feet when they're swimming, but it wasn't so good for the salamanders. You know, basically, they, when, when they they live along the little grass parts of the, of the stream bed. So they were really disrupting the population. So there was this movement called the Save Our Springs movement in Austin, and, um, and uh, basically trying to save the habitat for the salamander. And the solution was actually quite simple and, and not disruptive in any way. They just decided not to power wash the, 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 the stream bed. And so now if you swim in Barton Springs, occasionally you'll find at the bottom of the pool weeds and stuff that you might find in any natural pool but the, the salamanders are happy. So this is an example where, um, uh, where human activity was actually encroaching on um, you know, a populate, the only population of a, of a unique species of salamander. And in, in this case, the solution was quite simple. That's all I want to say. <laughs>